In a previous film, we explained the basis of situation ethics, and in this film, I'm going to evaluate situation ethics. I'm going to try and say what possibly are the major weaknesses of this theory, and perhaps one or two strengths as well. Remember, when we're looking at any moral theory, we use the acronym DARM, D-A-R-M, and the D stands for derivation. How is the idea of goodness derived in this moral theory? And remember that with situation ethics, Fletcher assumes, i.e. he posits, the idea that there is one intrinsic supreme norm of goodness, and that is agape love, a certain type of love. And we assume that, or we posit it, we cannot prove it. Application, if you remember in the previous film, we applied it to the idea of abortion. We said, when you look at abortion, you, could, you can look at a rule, thou shalt not kill, that's applied pretty strictly in places like Northern Ireland, where there's only one exception, which is the exception of saving the mother's life, and there's antinomianism on the other side. And between those two things, antinomianism meaning no rules or no law, there is situation ethics somewhere in the middle. But I want to think to today a little bit about the R and the M. The R stands for realism. How realistic is situation ethics as a theory that we could use in everyday life? And M, the question of motivation. Does it answer the question, why should I be moral, in the sense of, why should I follow this one supreme norm of love? D-A-R-M. So today, particularly the R and the M. I want to think, first of all, about the problem of consequentialist ethics. It's a problem that applies also to utilitarian ethics, if you've studied that. That is an ethical system that takes a value, happiness, utilitarianism, agape love, situation ethics, and applies it to situations through considering the likely consequences. I mean, there's one problem, big problem in fact, that these consequentialist theories face, and that is it is very hard to calculate exact consequences because we don't know how our actions will pan out in terms of its results. Take, for example, the Iraq war. In 2003, we entered the war believing there were weapons of mass destruction. There never were. We believed that we would replace the dictator Saddam Hussein with a better, more stable regime that was fairer to its citizens. We never did. In fact, Iraq dissolved into a kind of intertribal warfare between Shia, Sunni, and different sections of the country. So the consequences could not be calculated. And if we'd known what they were, very likely we'd have never entered the war at all. First problem, therefore, it's difficult to calculate consequences. The second problem is that love is a very demanding value. Agape love particularly, of all the Greek loves, is the most demanding. It means sacrificial, committed love to friend and stranger. And the difficulty is that we don't live our lives like that. It's unrealistic. We live according to circles of interest. If you imagine on the inner circle, you've got the people closest to you, your immediate family, your mum, your dad, those closest to you. Next, you might have your best friends. And then third, you might have your neighbours on a slightly further circle. And then acquaintances beyond that. And some way, miles in the distance, we have the stranger. And we only really think about the people in... Iraq or the people in Syria at the moment, when they appear on the news screen. The rest of the day, we just forget about them. And when asked to give the same amount of money or money according to need to the Syrians, there's no way that we're going to give that amount of money in preference to giving it to a best friend or just keeping it for myself. So the problem with agape love, it's a very, very demanding value. In fact, you might say it can only be realized if you're God himself or God incarnate, in other words, by Jesus Christ. For the rest of us, it is just too much. And thirdly, as a third problem, we have the issue of existential ethics. This has been a criticism leveled 
at situation ethics that is in fact a form of existentialism. Fletcher rejects this argument in his book. He says that existentialism lies on the antinomian side of the divide and situation ethics is closer, in a sense, to the centre between legalism and antinomianism than it is a pure form of antinomianism. But Pope Pius, beginning in the 1950s, he saw the great enemy of the Roman Catholic Church as relativism. And that, in a sense, that struggle of ideas got intensified in the 1960s in the era of free love, when it appeared that all the old laws, the old rules were being thrown over, laws of se- uh, rules of sexual conduct, for example. We had the Abortion Act 1967. We had the legalization of homosexual acts in 1968, divorce law reform 1969. So it seemed as though a lot of the old, nor- uh, the old rules, the old norms were being thrown over. Now, is this a fair criticism of situation ethics? Well, according to Fletcher, it isn't because he calls it principled relativism. So there is still the one principle at the heart of it. And he even says that we shouldn't ignore rules entirely. However, William Barclay points out in his book, Ethics in Permissive Society, that relativism and the absence of rules provides a problem for us because it seems to overthrow all the wisdom of past ages that is enshrined in social rules. The wisdom of my grandma, my parents and so on tends to be turned into laws in society and moral laws that we're expected to abide by. So relativism as a criticism may be fair.